Daniel, thank you very much. And we are very interested in your words. Thank you. Uh, this talk isn't going to be too technical. Uh, there are more technical details in the paper, in the proceedings. So this is my handheld radio. I very often travel with it just because I want to communicate with other ham operators. I want to discover signals in the RF spectrum. It's actually in my back uh, there. And it's quite nice. It can receive FM and AM pretty much from DC to 1 gigahertz. I promise this talk is not a commercial from Yeosu. But anyhow, it even supports some crude form of spectrum scanning. And this is supposed to be looking at the uh, FM broadcast band. And maybe you can see there are some FM stations. I don't know. So I think the way they accomplish this is by sweeping the receiver. Uh, something quite interesting about this radio is that it supports digital modes. So there's a bunch of DSP going on in there. But this isn't accessible to us. This is a closed source commercial product. Changing on a different topic, this is a DMR repeater site in Antarctica. Uh, Sp Spain has two uh, bases in Antarctica, and they need to run some communications for that. So in Deception Island, they have this uh, DMR repeater. And basically, by pure chance, I ended up going up to the site with my handheld radio. And uh, besides the DMR repeater, they also have some ubiquity uh, networking gear because uh, they link the site and they also uh, run the data from some JPS experiments over that. In the opposite corner of the world, this is a cell-based station in Iceland. This was uh, last summer which is when I actually started considering developing the project I'm presenting here. And this is in the volcano that was active uh, this year. Uh, unfortunately, it was off already when we get there. But as you can see, this is a very interesting site. If you love RF stuff, because it has probably LTE, maybe some of the older generation technologies, there's a webcam. There appears to be also an ubiquity device, a GPS to lock everything. So I was there again with my handheld radio, but really no ability to interact with these RF signals. I pulled uh, my cell phone out of my pocket. I have this LTE finder application, so I could even see what's going on in the cell base station, but th that was everything. So this is me uh, last year hunting for LTE signals somewhere in Madrid. I was interested in doing LTE signal analysis, and I needed to do my own recordings for that. And this is basically the cell tower station, which is closest to where I live. I try to find it with uh, going around with my car, and eventually I did. And I'm recording with a PCB Vivaldi antenna, not seen in this photograph. It's a US, USRP B205 Mini and a laptop. So that's the most common way if you want to get wideband SDR recordings. You grab the laptop, your SDR, and you go to the field. This is uh, the Great Balian Seabird uh, hunting for radar signals somewhere in the bay. This is uh, basically a promotional video from Etus Research. And I promise that this talk isn't either a commercial from Etus Research. So here he's using a, an Etus B200 and a laptop. As you can see, he's using a very similar equipment to the one I was using. But the striking thing, if you look at the information on the video, this is 2013. So it's rather striking that 10 years, in 10 years, I'm using almost the same equipment as Balint was using back then, because in a sense, things haven't changed that much. In another sense, things have evolved. So with this in mind, while traveling through Iceland, it came to me the idea that I wanted to do something new and different. And the main features for this product or project was that it needed to be very portable because I wanted to be able to explore the RF world in the field. I think that's one of the main motivations that led me into ham radio, being able to see RF energy, RF signals, which is something that you cannot see with your own eyes. You need 
electronic equipment to do that. It needed to have the ability to display and record wideband signals because going into the future and also today, most of the communications are wideband. For amateur radio, we often use uh, narrowband signals, but there are also people doing digital TV and moving into the future. I think the tendency will be into higher uh, microwave bands and higher bandwidth. And also my idea was to make heavy use of the FPGA for two practical reasons, which is if you want to do something portable, it needs to be small, it needs to consume not much power, and if you want to process wideband signals, it needs to have a lot of computing capability. And the way to do that is in an FPGA. In an FPGA, you can have much more uh, computing power per watt or per gram than you can with a software approach on a microcontroller or CPU. And the design idea I came up with is to use the Adam Pluto for this project and a uh, smartphone because anyone has a smartphone. Many people have the Adam Pluto. It is currently not so cheap, but there was a previous time when it was rather cheap and our devices was even giving out the Pluto for free in conferences, in workshops. So many people are using it for Q100 or for other experiments. So by doing this, I can already publish uh, something for a device that many people can use and uh, many, many people have already. So I call this project Maya SDR or Maya SDR. The name is just a reference to one of the stars in the Pleiades because I like how this name sounds. It doesn't have any more implications to it. And it is an open source FPGA based SDR project. The main goal is actually to promote FPGA development for radio because as I said earlier, there is not much uh, going on in FPGA and ham radio in particular. There is a lot of software development. There are many different SDR applications. There is actually some reinventing the wheel in software. And I don't think this is a bad thing. I think this is a good thing. It's good to have diversity. But if you look instead of the software to the FPGA world, there is not so much going on. So. I think there is the need to kick-start this uh, ball rolling because uh, there's also th something about the hardware and uh, the FPGA designs. There is not so much SDR hardware which has a good, capable FPGA because there are not so many FPGA designs or open source designs available for that. So why would you build the, so the hardware if you don't have the FPGA designs? So that's the idea, to get the ball rolling, and also to initiate a collaboration between the SDR and the FPGA communities. There is a very thriving open source FPGA community who is doing wonderful projects. Uh, most of them are based on graphics, or they run old games on very small FPGAs, and they implement um, ad hoc GPU for Doom or those sort of video games. And there are a few people who are involved in both worlds, both SDR and FPGA, doing open source designs. But I want to get more collaboration between these groups. I think it would be really, really interesting because radio is one of the best or most interesting applications of an FPGA, in my opinion. So, and as I said, I decided to focus on the Adam Pluto because many people have it. It has a good capable FPGA and an ARM CPU, so you have kind of have a small Raspberry Pi, in a sense, inside the box. Main features. It's an Adam Pluto firmware, so you just grab the firmware uh, from the web page, and if you're familiar with how to update the firmware from the Pluto, this is just the same procedure. You grab it, you copy it on the um, USB storage, and it's flashed, and it's easy. Many people have already installed my SDR on the Pluto, and I haven't had a single question about someone getting stuck and how do I do this. So this means it is, it's easy. The instructions are working for everyone. 
So I'm happy about that. Uh, since the capabilities that the Maya SDR firmware offers are, in a sense, complementary to the uh, analog devices firmware, you can go back any time to the original firmware just by flashing it again. So you can swap between either one or the other one. Unfortunately, there's not the capability of having both installed at the same time just because there is not enough uh, EMMC or QSPI memory. There's not enough flash on the Pluto to hold the two designs. And there isn't also a convenient way to decide which one you want to boot. There's not really a button or something to, to change. So the, the way to go back and forth is flash one firmware or flash the other one. It has a web user interface. So that means it can really be used from any device. It can be used from your phone, from your PC. You just not need to run a network connection uh, to the Pluto, which can be uh, the USB cable, as I'm doing here for the demo later on. Or if you're using this remotely, you could have an Ethernet adapter on the Pluto, which uh, many people do, and then connect by Ethernet uh, through your computer or through anything, or perhaps even through the internet. The reason of doing a web interface is uh, because if I want this to be used from many different platforms, I would become crazy if I needed to do an Android app, an iOS app, a PC application, a Linux application. So I think the web is really a good way to get something which is cross-platform and works for everyone. I did a little bit of web design 15 years back, I think, and really the state of web development has improved a lot. The kind of things you can do today are really, really awesome. The uh, actual features it currently supports is a real-time waterfall display of up to 60 megahertz or so. That's what the chip inside here allows. And if you use the Pluto with the usual firmware, you can only access about 4 megahertz of that because your IQ samples need to pass uh, to the ARM CPU, then they need to go through the USB 2 connector and thingy. So there are bottlenecks on that. Uh, if we bring signal processing into the FPGA, then we can access those 60 megahertz of bandwidth, as you will see. And also, you can do IQ recordings at uh, that rate. So you can record to the Pluto DDR uh, at up to 400 megabytes of data. And the idea is you click the record button and you start recording either until you run out of memory on the Pluto. So if that happens, the recording finishes automatically or until you press stop. And then what you do is you download that recording file over the USB connection. And of course, the download will be slower than the recording itself because, again, it's a USB 2 connection, so it cannot support the real-time data rate of 60 megahertz. But you can get the recording on your PC or on your phone. So coming back to those examples in uh, Iceland or in Antarctica, if I had uh, this Pluto device with me in my backpack, what I would have done was pull out my phone, pull out my Pluto, uh, connect them, and just click record, copy to the phone. And I can even do that many, many times because these days phones have 64 gigabytes of uh, flash or something. So you can do many recordings in that way. And I think that's wonderful for people going in the field trying to capture some signals. Uh, wide band especially, but also narrow band if needed. This is a deployment diagram of the components. So you have the uh, Zinc, which is the FPGA chip. As I said, it has an FPGA and an ARM CPU. And the component of Maya, uh, which runs on the FPGA, is called Maya HDL. That's the FPGA design. Then there is a software application running on the CPU, which is called Maya HTTP. And it's called HTTP because it's a HTTP server. That's the way you can access it through the web browser. And then on your portable device or on your computer or any machine, you run your web browser. 
and you run Maya Wasm, which is the web user interface application. So Maya HDL is implemented in Amaranth, which is a relatively new open source FPGA design uh, language and also toolkit, which is based in Python. And that's interesting because not so many people are familiar with Verilog and VHDL, which are the uh, usual languages uh, for designing FPGA on the industry. But many people are familiar with Python. So I think that lowers the entry barrier to FPGA design. And for me, it's also a much more capable tool because in Python, you can do wonderful things you cannot really dream of doing in Verilog or VHDL just because Python is intended as a wide purpose programming language. And I do exploit that in uh, my HDL. There are examples in some uh, letter I published a few months ago. The software is written in Rust. Rust is a very nice uh, low level system language which tries to fix some of the shortcomings of C, in particular regarding memory management. It is much more difficult to get segmentation faults or other kind of issues when uh, programming with Rust, but still you get the same level of performance and uh, low level access to, to the hardware you need it here where you are accessing FPGA registers and DMAs. And the web UI also is implemented in Rust. These days you can uh, do web development in almost any language because there is something called WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is some kind of abstract assembly for an abstract machine that runs in the web browser. And uh, you program in Rust or in C++ or in anything, you compile to WebAssembly and then it will run on the web browser or on any kind of platform having a web browser. So main features of the FPGA design. It has a custom FFT core, so this is done completely from scratch. It doesn't use any of the Xilinx uh, IP cores. Everything is open source, everything is Amaranth, everything is backed by a simulation to check that it's working correctly. And uh, the FFT core is using a spectrometer, that's the kind of thing that computes your waterfall, which uh, then you display on your device. And there are custom DMAs to move the data between the FPGA and the DDR memory, which then the ARM CPU can access and move the data into your computer phone. These custom D DMAs are done focusing on really, really low resource usage. And I'm speaking about 20 or 30 lookup tables, if anyone knows lookup tables is the unit of mm, resource usage for FPGA. So this is really, really, really small, but still you get very good performance out of it. And we need to do that because the FPGA on the Pluto is not particularly large for Xilinx standards. And if we want to build up more capability, we need to be careful about how we use these resources. Otherwise, we would run out of space. Uh, here is a diagram, a Vivado diagram of how this looks like. I'm not sure if it's good on the screen. Yeah, maybe. So uh, what we have here is the Zinc uh, processor. This represents the ARM CPU. You always have it in in this kind of designs. Here in blue is the Maya SDR IP core. And here in yellow is uh, some IP core from analog devices, which is used as an interface to the AD9361 or 363 uh, on the uh, Pluto. That's the radio frequency chip. So this in yellow is the same that you have on the analog devices FPGA design. Uh, for the Pluto firmware, for the default Pluto firmware, but I have tweaked the options to reduce the uh, FPGA usage because if you take the analog devices FPGA design, it's already full. You cannot fit anything more, so you need to throw away a bunch of stuff which is not needed for this, and you need to reduce the uh, the options of this uh, block in yellow to be to be able to fit more stuff. 
This is how the design looks on the FPGA. So here you can see the utilization. As you can see, there is plenty more space available. We're only using about a quarter of the FPGA resources, except for IO pins, but that's your physical pins on the FPGA. Of course, we're using most of them. And then in blue, you can see the uh, Maya SDR IP core. So that's using less than 50% of the FPGA. This block in yellow is, again, the interface to the analog devices chip. As you can see, it's huge. It's not doing much more than moving data back and forth between the RF chip and the FPGA. So by having a custom interface, we would be able to reduce this usage. And here in orange, we have uh, something which is called an interconnect that is used to interconnect uh, the communications of uh, all the blocks on the FPGA with the CPU. That's also a Silinx IP core. And again, it's huge. Silinx IP cores tend to be rather large, rather easy to use, and they have multiple options in case you need them. But uh, again, in the future, having a custom interconnect uh, will uh, make it possible to reduce this to a significant fraction of its current size. Uh, very, very quickly, because I want to have some time for the demo, uh, my HTTPD, uh, again, this is the application that runs on the ARM CPU, controls the IP core, serves your web user interface, and uses a REST API for control and a WebSocket server to stream the waterfall data. Uh, that means that it's really easy to access this application from a Python script, for example. And I do have at home a system which is monitoring the usage of the wideband transponder on Q100. That's just a Pluto, which is connected to my home network. And I have a Python script running on a PC, which is grabbing data. It's 30 lines of Python or maybe 20 lines of Python, grabs data, writes on the disk. And that's all I need to have a um, uh, registry of how the wideband transponder has been used over time. Maya Wasm is the user interface. And you can see here a screenshot used uh, in a phone. And the way to display the waterfall in your phone is to use WebGL2. So that's kind of OpenGL, uh, GPU graphics programming, but for the web. And uh, you have HTML forms for control. The key technical features of this project, as I said, there is a custom FPGA FFT core. And uh, that would be applicable in a wide range of projects anywhere you need an FFT to do a waterfall or to do some signal processing. You can use it. Uh, it's small. It's uh, Again, design uh, not to use so many resources, but still be quite capable. And uh, then there is a custom WebGL render engine. So that's the kind of application that decides what needs to be plotted, configures the GPU, and so on and so forth for the uh, waterfall display. And uh, something else is uh, to manage the DMA buffers and how you access the memory from the ARM CPU. You need to do uh, really awful stuff with the Linux kernel. This is detailed in the paper, but this was the most tricky part of the project to get good performance. Uh, you need to do your cache invalidation, but it's uh, actually very tricky to do it properly. What's next? Uh, as you will imagine from the demo, this already kind of looks similar to a WebSDR. And I'm not using any of the usual WebSDR applications because they are not so easy to use from a phone. So I wanted to develop this from scratch. So the next obvious step is to be able to receive and transmit analog modulations with your Pluto and your phone. You already have a microphone and, and a speaker on the phone. So that would be great. Also, maybe support from some digital modulations. How about transmitting digital video from this? There's also Phosphor. Phosphor is some kind of more advanced uh, waterfall display in which you can see signals which are very brief. So pulse-like signals or very short packets. This is 
and their development. So there is an FPGA design for uh, some ETUS uh, devices and porting this over to the Pluto. Uh, was an idea of uh, Sylvain TNT, who is the author of Fosfor, and myself uh, a few months uh, ago. So this might happen. When? Uh, who knows? So live demo, a uh, couple minutes. There's something I want to show. Uh, this is the MySDR web page, and there's a wonderful demo. So maybe this will load. It depends. Yeah, it's loaded. So with your phone, with your PC, you can run this. It's a demo just of the waterfall. It has a pre-recorded uh, waterfall. It's actually a JPEG file <laughs> looping back. But you have all the controls, so you can zoom in, you can pan around, and you can really see how this looks on your device. But uh, for the Pluto, let me open this up and see if it works, or if we have demo effect. Let me ping it. Yeah, this was working before. <laughs> Did I do it here? Yeah. We do have ping. Yeah, I think the problem is just the USB connection reset at some point, maybe when I moved it. So this is one of the LTE signals here. We are looking at 60 megahertz of spectrum. We can zoom in, uh, we can pan around, and we can even hit a uh, record. And it will do a wideband recording of 60 megahertz for us. As you can see, it's really short. It's just a few seconds. That's what you can fit in uh, 400 megahertz. And then you can go to the recording menu and say download recording and it will take maybe 30 seconds or so to record. And I'm showing this with the PC because I do not have a way to share screen with the phone, but there's a video of me using the very same thing from the phone in the Maya SDR web page. And that's all I had for today. So thank you very much for this nice contribution. It is a very impressive paper what you presented to the, uh, to the SDRA. And of course your demonstration shows that you are really a paper which should take the Ulrich Rode Award. Thank you very much for that. Well thank deserved. <laughs> I have a question personally. I, uh, from my experience with Pluto, I fear all time the limit of the USB transfer with USB to Ethernet connector. Mm -hmm. So how do you break this? I do not, so, because I cannot. Yeah. So what is happening here is when you download the recording, it's downloading at about 10 megabits per second. Yeah. As you saw, that's a recording that took maybe a couple of seconds to make and 30 seconds to download. And the other thing which is going through the USB connector is the waterfall data. But the waterfall data is not yeah, so much Yeah, this is limited, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there is, there is a little bit that could be improved, and I think ADI is looking into that because currently, because of how Linux DMA drivers work, there is a memory copy in there. When you grab the data from the FPGA and you want to transfer it to the USB, you cannot use the same buffer, or it's rather tricky to use the same buffer, and there's a memory copy. So that limits your throughput. That you could improve, but still it's USB 2, so not, nothing can be done about it. Okay. At least for this particular hardware product. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, there is one. Thanks for the great project. Um, I do not have an Atom Pluto at home, but I do have a Pluto Plus. So would that uh, firmware of yours work of that, on that hardware as well? 
the very exact same firmware doesn't run because the FPGA pins are different. It's not exactly the same FPGA package. They use the different package. So that means you need a different FPGA bitstream. And there is actually an open issue on the GitHub repository because someone asks the same question. I want to have this running on my Pluto Plus. And what I said is, I do not have a Pluto Plus. So what I need is from someone from the community that has a Pluto Plus and the interest to test not only this first release, but releases as they keep coming, because otherwise your support for the Pluto Plus will break eventually, to be interested in, in testing this. I can uh, help with uh, making the firmware. There are not so many changes that need to be done, but someone needs to be testing. Okay, so then okay. let's have a chat about a that afterwards. Big invitation to sponsor him a Pluto Plus. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, it's, it's better if someone uh, does and the work is shared, you know, because there is only a limited amount of work that a single person can do. Okay. <laughs> we have questions from the chat. So, one question, SV3 EXP, is it feasible that an FT8 decoder encoder uh, can be implemented in FPGA? Mm, good question. Uh, an encoder, certainly, because it's just an FSK thingy and it's very simple to do. A decoder, I'm not sure, because if you want to use the same kind of decoding algorithm which is available on uh, WJSTX, then that's quite focused on a CPU implementation. So you have all your samples in a buffer, you run some FFTs, you do something, you do signal cancellation, you do something else. So I don't know. It would be certainly tricky to do it on an FPGA, but mm, for sure it's possible with enough work and large enough FPGA. Okay. There are some more comments. Uh, Jean-Michel Fried says, Amaranth is a very low generator that will feed any, any synthesi uh, synthesizer? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and the uh, people in the chat are communi communicating between each other. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that should That's be interesting. That's a, <laughs> a good point of view. <laughs> when the people in the chat are is, uh, asking questions and others are respond uh, uh, and make answers to that, that is very excellent. Everything what we want, a discussion. <laughs> and the discussion is sometimes very limited here because we have a timetable for the next. Yeah, yeah, okay, that could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a good we idea we for take next, it for next the next year. year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we also have a comment from uh, our friend Hervé Beglen. And he says, uh, Vivado is free for small AMD Xilinx FPGA standard edition, like the sync inside the Pluto. And Erwin says, Pluto has ARM CPU for the same. That's right. Yeah, good yeah. discussion. <laughs> um, uh, one question from my side. Um, did you ever thought of a transfer to other Xilinx uh, 7010 uh, units like the Red Pitaya to uh, change, or did, did you have some experience uh, to use uh, Amaranth and the design of this FPGA on these devices? Yeah, definitely. In fact, I have the question about the Red Pitaya being asked by email <laughs> a couple of hours ago, and I think that should be possible. Uh, it kind of requires more work than to support the Pluto Plus because it's not the same RF front-end or RF chip. But even so, that would be possible, that would be interesting, and having this capability of wideband spectrum display for HF, which would be what the Red Pitaya would allow, would also be rather good. Okay. So yes, that would be possible. Enough time? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that uh, is a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions more from the audience? No? Okay. Thank you very much. We say a big applause. Thank you.